Hi everyone, welcome to Selangor Human Resource Development Center or SHRVC. In short, what you guys are about to see next are a series of webinar sessions on various topics that we at SHRVC previously organized. We hope you will be able to enjoy and learn a couple of things from this webinar session today. Yang berbahagia Tan Sri, Tan Sri, Dato Dato, ladies and gentlemen, participants. I'm pleased to welcome you to this webinar, uh, to this webinar room for the webinar on artificial intelligence, uh, AI and robotics entitled How AI and Robotics Impacts Your Life. So I'm pleased to announce that this event is a joint effort between uh, a few parties that includes the Malaysia South-South Association, MASA, the Malaysia Autonomous Intelligence and Robotics Association, MyIRA, the Expertise Resource Association, ERA, and the Malaysia-Japan Economic Association, Majeka, with the support of the Selangor Human Resource Development Center, HSRDC. My name is Sufan, and I'll be your MC for this afternoon. So for a smooth, pro uh, uh, smooth proceeding of today's conference, we would like to announce some housekeeping points for your attention. Please note that all attendees will be muted and their cameras will be turned off for this webinar. Uh, we encourage attendees to utilize the rename feature that's available in Zoom to identify yourselves and the organization you represent for the benefit of the host. So you may wish to do so. You can put your name and then followed by your organization. And uh, we encourage all attendees to use the chat feature uh, to chat, to network, and to post your questions uh, um, for, for, for this uh, to the panelists. Um, so, but uh, for the questions, kindly ensure your question is written in English and if possible to specify who you like your question to be directed to. Otherwise, we will leave it to our uh, Miss Hanis, who are our moderator, to, to decide uh, who to uh, attention the question to. So, without further ado, uh, once again, I'm pleased to uh, welcome all of you to this webinar. Uh, we have today uh, participants who have registered. Uh, and we hope they'll be logging in soon. Uh, the participants are coming in from Malaysia, Chile, <coughs> Japan, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Ghana, Indonesia, Kenya, Laos, Singapore, Somalia, wow. Turkey, and Turkey uh, to this webinar. So we hope uh, they will be signing in soon. Um, so this afternoon's discussion will be a very interesting one. We will learn about what AI is and its applications in our daily life and how or what robots can do, and how they can sync with applied AI to improve our lives. So it's a very, um, there are four speakers, uh, very interesting. So without further ado, I'd like to kickstart the event by inviting Yang Bahagia Tan Sri, Azman Hashim, who is the president of MASA, as well as Majeka, uh, to, to, to say a few words uh, uh, here. Uh, I'm pleased also to mention that Tansri Azman was recently awarded the Order of the Rising Sun, Gold and Silver Star by His Majesty the Emperor of Japan. Congratulations, Tansri. Thank you. So, uh, so Tansri, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you, Sufan. Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon to everyone. I'm honored to participate in this webinar on AI. <coughs> Sorry, you uh, flip the page. Yeah, I have to mention. I mentioned. Uh, sorry, I, I, I did not mention. Sorry, I did not mention. Can you slip it? I just want to start. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, my my slip must start. Okay. You have uh, encountered AI. <laughs> okay. My, that's all. okay, I just, I'm honored to participate in this webinar on AI and robotics organized by MASA, my IRA, ERA, and Majeka in association with Selangor Human Resource Development, uh, <clears throat> called HR, H, S, HRDC. But before that, let me uh, welcome, of course, first Mr. Yong Chong Soon, the president of Myra, and Mr. Wong Lian Ki, president of uh, ERA, 
Excellencies, High Commissioners, and my fellow committee members in Massa and Majeka, moderator, panelists, participants, welcome all of them. Uh, I'm honored to uh, participate, as I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> Today's webinar is the third in a series of three webinars for this year on the topic concerning the digital economy related to the fourth industrial revolution, 4R, about artificial intelligence, AI, and robotics, and how they can individually or together unlock numerous possibilities for improvement in our lives. Up until only a decade ago, AI was not a buzzword until now. Today, we know our respective businesses generate a lot of data, and this data can be mined and analyzed to reveal hidden insights and patterns that can be very uh, value accretive. With an AI system that can provide insights, we can make faster, more accurate, even allowing automated decisions to, to, be, to carry it out for us. Uh, freeing business owners to focus on other aspects of their business. Robotics, on the other hand, is another big topic. As we all know, robots are increasingly seen to be the solution to many challenges. Robotics are seen as the solution to hot, heavy, and hazardous solutions situations that, that can perform dutifully under such conditions, minimizing health crisis, employee turnover, and employee training issues. With big advancements in technology <clears throat> that have cut costs and expanded capabilities, investments in robots are fast proving to be a viable path to profitability as they can improve a speed to market, sales, and adapt to changing demands, produce consistent quality outcomes, thereby providing a rapid uh, return on investment. Today, robots are deployed in many sectors of the economy, such as aerospace, automotive, food and beverage, manufacturing, pharmaceutical and medical, uh, retail and apparel, and of course, much, much more. By function, there are examples. Uh, <coughs> E-commerce and fulfillment, uh, packing, storage, and shipping, some examples. Uh, <coughs> caregiving as well, security and monitoring, and many more. By technology, you have conveyor systems, industrial robots, collaborative robots, autonomous robots, smart and intelligent robots, <laughs> and more. According to projections by Gartner, their supply uh, <coughs> chain practice, the demand for robotics goods to person system, they call it G2P, where robots deliver goods to a person who remains in one place, will quadruple through 2023 to enforce social distancing in warehouses. <laughs> These G2P systems also bring about wider long-term benefits in efficiency and productivity. And it is predicted that through 2024, supply chain organizations will invest in applications that support AI and advance analytics capabilities. In other <clears throat> prediction by Gartner, it is expected that by 2025, half of cloud <clears throat> data centers will be using advanced robots. These AI-centered developments will increase operating efficiency by 30% in four areas highlighted uh, <clears throat> to see the most impact 
from robotic, robotic deployments, which include uh, decommissioning and destroying of uh, drives, remote monitoring via robot sensors, security maintenance via human temperature checks and license plate recognition, and employing AI and machine learning towards operations, especially in human machine interaction using natural language augmented by machine learning improvement. <clears throat> According to the International Data Corporation, IDC, the Worldwide Artificial uh, Spending Guide, spending on AI systems will reach nearly 98 billion US dollars by 2023. The World Robotics 2021 Industrial Robots Report demonstrates a record of 3 million industrial robots operating in factories worldwide, an increase of 10%. The data is indicative that AI and robotics are thriving and with the post-COVID phase will be growing even faster. Digital transformation today invariably includes AI and robotic technologies with people and business processes. The fast-paced innovation and applications that we see today seems to provide us with solutions for our aging population with increasing longevity, labor shortages and gaps and even foreign labor challenges and also better expected outcomes of increased productivity, enhanced efficiency, improved safety in some instances, and higher and consistent quality. Having said this, issues that need to be managed may include, may include the loss of jobs and the perceived high initial cost of investment and adaptation. Moving forward, selecting the right candidate both human and robots for the job is critical for success. A combined effort from HR, IT, and systems investigators and integrators will be required to maximize the human to robot combination to ensure organizational objectives are met. I do see a future where we will have to coexist with robots. And these robots will be progressively more intelligently wired as we go forward. This also opens up a new realm of business possibilities for new investments, for training, reskilling, and new jobs creation. The webinar today aims to introduce AI and robotics, its applications, possibilities, benefits and opportunities to participants. I hope that from this webinar, our panel of experts can impress on us the potential and applications of AI and robotics and how businesses can adopt these technologies to augment and enhance their business productivity and resilience. With this, I wish our moderator and panelists a fruitful discussion ahead, and I hope all participants will benefit from the liberations today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nasri, uh, for your, your introductory remarks. Uh, now, may I please uh, invite Mr. Yong Chong Soon. Uh, he is the co-founder and president of, uh, of Malaysian, Malaysian Autonomous Intelligence and Robotics Association, MyIRA. The objective of this association is to mobilize businesses, policy makers, academia, industries, inventors, and players of all related industries to collaborate and create an ecosystem offering affordable solutions. The association is also promoting startups in related fields in the area of robotics, drones, and AI. So Mr. Yong, the screen is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Yasman Hashim, President Malaysia South South Association. Uh, Mr. Wang Lenki, President ERA. Excellencies and High Commissioners, our moderator, Ms. Han Islam, panelists, Professor Technologies Dr. Sim Yi Wai, Mr. Oliver Tian, Mr. Meng Su Ho, 
Dr. Chua Wenxian, participants, ladies and gentlemen. A good day to all of you. As uh, Tan Sri mentioned, this is our third and, and uh, final webinar for the year. We started with the topic of cybersecurity, followed by talks on drones. And today we touch on the subject of how AI and robotics impacts your life. A topic that I believe everyone is familiar with, but may not appreciate how it impacts us. Uh, this morning, a few of us was at the opening ceremony of Selangor Aviation Show 2021. And I'm sure it, it will not surprise you that besides my IRA having a booth at the exhibition, there are a number of exhibitors exhibiting AI and robotic solutions. And in any case, a drone by definition is a robot, whether it flies, dives, swim or on wheels. I would like to take this opportunity to express my thanks and appreciation to Sufan, Sam, of MASA and our very own communications director, Hannes, for their tireless efforts in ensuring that our past and current event run smoothly and hopefully future events as well. And my thanks also to all the panelists who spoke at the last two events. Uh, Tanshri Asman just shared with us in his remarks the global scenario for uh, of the AI and robotics industry and the potential market size as well as a multitude of applications AI and robotics can and uh, or is already deployed. Here in Malaysia, the government has been promoting uh, the adoption of uh, such technologies through many agencies like MAGIC, MDAC, uh, MIT, MIDA, uh, MIMOS, etc. And it is timely because according to McKinsey research uh, report, 50% of work time in Malaysia is spent on repetitive activities that are highly uh, automatable. Uh, in fact, AI can automate those routine tasks augment employees' capabilities and allow time to focus on more stimulating and higher value adding work. I hope the panelists will touch on this augmentation of human efforts uh, by robots and AI. Another research done by PwC showed that global GDP uh, uh, gross uh, domestic uh, product could be up by up to 14% higher in less than 10 years. That's in the year 2030 as a result of AI. Uh, sizable growth by any standard. Um, our government, interestingly, is more optimistic. Under the 4IR, uh, that's Fourth Industrial Revolution, and My Digital Blueprint, the government aims to boost productivity in Malaysia by 30%, more than double of what uh, PWC research showed across all sectors in the same time frame, and with AI being the critical enabler. Uh, today, you will note that our esteemed panel of speakers are uniquely different in many ways from their background, their work experiences, to their current involvements in AI and robotics. And I'm grateful that they're willing to share their thoughts uh, in this webinar. Last but not least, I'd like to thank Slango Human Resources Development Corporation or SHRDC for hosting the web platform for this webinar. And I hope all our participants will benefit from today's proceedings. Uh, without further ado, I will hand, now hand over the uh, session back to the MC. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Yong, for your, your insights. Uh, so, on behalf of the organizers, allow me to take this opportunity to thank uh, Yang Babagia Tan Sri, Azman Haji, and Mr. Yong for setting the tone for this webinar. So, before we proceed to the very interesting panel discussions, uh, can I maybe request uh, all our panelists uh, and role plays to turn on the camera so that we can take a group photo. Uh, yeah, shall we do that now? Uh, yeah, Mr. Ming, uh, you could turn it on. And uh, so, Mr. Samuel, uh, if you will kindly take the shots now. Thank you. Everybody, when you're ready. Well, uh, with you can smile. <laughs> <laughs> With a mask, you can see. Yeah. All right, everybody smile. Three, <laughs> one. Four, three, two, one. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Samuel. Mm. So thank you, everyone. So now we move into the panel discussion. <clears throat> but before that, I'd like to remind all attendees, if you could uh, make use of the Q&A box, the chat feature to submit your questions um, and also to identify the panelists, uh, if you wish, uh, who, who amongst the panel you wish to direct your questions to. All right, so uh, with, with, without wait, uh, further ado, I'm pleased to introduce to you our moderator this afternoon. She is Ms. Hanis Lam, who is the Communications Director 
of the Malaysian Autonomous Intelligence Robotics Association. Uh, Ms. Hanis is also the co-founder of Best Events Productions. Sindhya Berhad is an agency that produces tech uh, trade shows such as the Global Drone Conference and the Hackathon 2019-2020. Uh, through uh, her other companies, uh, Anta Solutions, she promotes a variety of software and digital solutions for businesses. So, uh, Ms. Hanis, the stage is yours now. Or rather, the screen is yours. <laughs> the screen. Thank you. Thanks, Ufan. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And today, we will start off with the first speaker. His name, of course, I'm sure you're pretty familiar, is Professor, Professor T.S. Dr. Sim Yi Wai. He's the Dean of Computing and Engineering at Quest International University. And he'll be speaking about what is artificial intelligence and its applications in daily life. So a little bit of a background. Um, from personal assistance in smartphones to self-driving cars, AI is progressing rapidly over the recent years. So while science fiction of, often portrays AI as robots with human-like characteristics, AI can, can encompass anything from Google's AlphaGo to autonomous robots on the factory floors. So um, Dr. Sim will explain what AI is and how technology is being used. And like it or not, the wave of AI is unstoppable. So we'll need to embrace it with open arms and work alongside it to create a brighter and better future. So Dr. Sim, the screen is yours. Right, thank you, Hanis. Uh, just let me share my screen. I just lost it just now. So let me do a share again. Okay, so I just want to double check with everyone that uh, my screen is visible. Okay, thank you, uh, CS. So uh, once again, uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining these sessions. And also I need to uh, say thank you uh, to them three, uh, Asman and uh, Mr. Yong for actually the introductions and also Ms. Hanis. Uh, that safe uh, that will nicely set up uh, what actually we are uh, having uh, how AI is actually impacting us and how uh, is actually uh, been doing in the markets. So um, I'm going to go straight uh, to my uh, this slide here. So this slide basically shows that in recent years the way of uh, AI or artificials actually has stopped across the groups. Uh, Gartner had forecasted that AI global market will reach uh, $134.8 billion by the year of 2025. And uh, AI is everywhere. It helps banks to make loan decisions. Uh, it's used to identify and treat cancer. It can even drive a car. So if you have been reading the news headline as well, you will also notice uh, AI is actually increasingly replacing human jobs in all walks of life. And that comes to, catch, uh, to the question of uh, what actually is AI and how does it work? So uh, let's take a look at the definition of AI before I go on and describe how it works. So while the term AI has uh, entered the common language and become frequently mentioned in the media, there is no really shared definition. So uh, in the broadest sense, a machine is said to have artificial intelligence if it can interpret data, potentially learn from the data and use the knowledge to adapt and achieve uh, specific goals. So the idea behind it is that human intelligence can be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. And AI is not a single technology, but rather an umbrella term. So the idea of AI was brought up by a scientist named uh, Alan Turing in uh, 1950. He asked an uh, interesting questions in one of his research papers. Uh, so he asked, can machines think? So according to Turing's idea to determine whether or not a machine is capable of thinking like a human being, it must pass a game called a Turing test. So in this test, uh, an evaluator will ask a series of questions to a machine and a human in different rooms at the same time. So if the evaluator cannot tell who is a machine and who is a human, we can claim that the machine is capable of thinking like a human. 
And since then, scientists spend a lot of effort and time in researching and developing a machines or algorithms that can pass the Turing test. So as early as in the 1950s, uh, there were already attempts by scientists from a variety of fields in creating intelligent machines uh, using symbolic AI and later uh, expert system in the 1980s. So however, these attempts were not very successful uh, when dealing with real world problems as they were built on humans reasoning and knowledge. And the failures were mainly due to the fact that we can know more than we can tell. Right. So it's a connective uh, phenomenon that uh, there exist many tasks which we understand intuitively how to perform, but cannot verbalize the rules or procedures behind it. So to apply uh, AI in daily life, we need to find a different approach right, in solving real-world problems. So perhaps we can borrow some ideas on how humans uh, accumulate intelligence. So human uh, intelligence came from uh, experience by learning and uh, remembering lessons. So we adjust our perceptions towards the world by, uh, by trials and errors. And in such a manner or way, uh, when we encounter a similar situation, we can easily reuse our past experience in dealing with it. So in order to greatly reduce uh, the content that needs to be memorized and processed, uh, we humans are also good at uh, classifying and labeling things right into categories. So can we feed experience to machines to learn? Or well, the answer is yes, and we can uh, and we call such an approach as machine learning. So machine learning can uh, automatically find the correlation model uh, between uh, event features and results based on historical data. Uh, it can then be used to perform classifications uh, automatically or predict future values for decisions making. So uh, as with many methods, uh, there are different ways to train uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, which we can categorize them into supervised learning, uh, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning, uh, each uh, with their own advantages and disadvantages. So uh, supervised learning is actually defined by its use of labeled uh, data sets to train algorithms to classify data or predict outcomes accurately. And uh, supervised learning helps in solving a variety of real world problems at scale, such as uh, spam detection, uh, risk evaluations, and forecast of sales as well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have uh, unsupervised learning, which uh, uses algorithms to analyze and cluster unlabeled data sets. Also, this is different from the previous case where the data are labeled, but in this case, all the data they are unlabeled. So these algorithms discover hidden patterns or, or data groupings without the need of human interventions. So its ability to discover uh, similarities and differences in information uh, make it the ideal solution for exploratory data analysis, right? And also cross-selling strategies, uh, customer segmentations, uh, and also especially image and pattern recognition. So it's used uh, to reduce the number of features in a model, right, through the process of uh, dimensionality reduction as well. So what about the, uh, the third type, which is the reinforcement machine learning? So it's actually a behavioral machine learning model that is uh, similar to supervised learning, but the algorithm isn't trained using sampled data, right? So this model learns as it goes, are using trials and, er uh, and errors. And a sequence of successful outcomes will be reinforced to develop the best recommendations or policy for a given problem. So a good example of using reinforcement learning is actually a robot learning how to walk. So at this point, you may be wondering, uh, what about deep learning, right? Is it uh, also a type of uh, machine learning? So, well, uh, the term deep learning was often used uh, interchangeably with machine learning, but in actual fact, uh, there are significant differences between the two. And in 1980s, uh, machine learning was mainly based on uh, mathematical algorithms. But however, when we come to the years uh, 2010, uh, with the expand, uh, exponential expansions and uh, availability of data, and uh, together with the advancements in uh, computational power, 
uh, have spawned a new machine learning approach, uh, which we call deep learning. So in fact, deep learning is actually a type of machine learning, it's a subset of it. So a deep learning model is designed to uh, continually analyze data with a logic structure similar to how a human would draw conclusions. So to achieve this, deep learning uh, applications use a layered structure of algorithms, uh, which we call uh, artificial neural networks. So the design of uh, an artificial neural network is inspired by the biological neural network of the human brain, uh, leading to the process of learning that is far more capable than that of a standard machine learning models. So a major difference between uh, the traditional machine learning algorithms and the one in deep learning is the feature extraction approach as shown on my slide here. So the features are actually uh, specific structures in the image. Uh, it can be points, edges or objects. So um, or an expert would have to actually select the relevant features uh, in a more traditional machine learning algorithms. The deep learning model is capable of doing this automatically so they can extract the features by themselves. So deep learning shows huge potential in areas uh, where access to vast amount of data is available. So it has been used to do a lot of uh, amazing things such as uh, beating the world's uh, best goal chess player. I'm sure you heard about AlphaGo, right? So this is the AlphaGo here. And uh, driving cars, especially uh, uh, in the case of Tesla and painting portraits as well. But right, now that we have some basic understanding of AI in the modern world, so let's look at where can we apply AI to solve uh, real world problems. So AI changes the way we communicate, solve daily tasks and how we work. So it is actually a great tool for automating processes, uh, accelerating decision making, reducing mistakes, uh, strengthening securities, and even providing better services and experience to the customers. So the applications of AI in the real world are plenty, right? as you can see in my slides here. So do think about the list of these uh, applications that uh, I, I've been showing you here. By no means, uh, it's not an exhaustive uh, one. And I'm sure more applications uh, will be developed as AI advances in the future. A prominent AI expert, uh, so it's by the name of Dr. Lee, uh, proposed an excellent framework to describe the development of AI applications, which uh, he named as the four ways of AI. So in the first wave of AI development, we are dealing uh, primarily with recommendation engines. So that learns from masses of user uh, data to curate personalized co uh, online content. So uh, think Amazon's or Shopee's uh, spots on product recommendations, or that up next YouTube video you just have to watch before getting back to work, or Facebook ads that you seem to know what you want to buy before you do. Right, so uh, powered by the data following through our networks, uh, Internet AI uh, leverages the fact that users automatically label data as we browse. So clicking versus not clicking, uh, lingering on a web page longer than we did uh, uh, compared to the others, hovering over Facebook video to see what happens at the end. So this cascade of a label uh, data you build, uh, build a detailed picture of our personalities, habits, demands, and desire. So it's actually the perfect recipe for more tailored content to keep us on a different platform. And in the second wave, business AI relies on the data that companies have already labeled in the past. So using complex data analysis, AI can detect and process uh, weekly correlated data. It can predict your future health, your wellness, uh, financial status, and also social behavior. So for example, uh, mobile payments and uh, a, uh, and micro uh, loans app, so which means it's apps for you to borrow money, can determine your ability to repay loans, right? Based on seemingly unrelated data stored in your smartphone, uh, such as how much battery is left in the phone, uh, the speed at which the users enter their date of birth, uh, the frequency of ordering takeaway food, right? So all this can be used to determine whether you can you are a good paymaster or not. And by applying these AI algorithms to finance insurance, companies can uh, minimize uh, default rates and, and optimize their uh, premiums. So moving on to the third wave, 
perception AI expands the way we interact with the cyberspace by having uh, visual and acoustic sensory. So this sensor enable uh, IoT devices will turn our world into a cyber physical one. So imagine walking into a grocery store, uh, scanning your face to pull up your most uh, common purchases. And also there's an indoor virtual assistant reminds you to get your spouse a favorite gift uh, for upcoming anniversaries. And even you can also check out uh, the store by using a facial recognition payment system. Right? So this is actually uh, happening now. You know, it's not in the future, it's actually happening now. And perception AI will bring the convenience and abundance of the cyberspace into our physical world. And building on the previous three waves, the fourth one, uh, autonomous AI gives machines the ability to sense and respond to the world around them. So this enables the machines to move and act on their own. So uh, think about swarms of drones that can selectively spray and harvest uh, the entire farms with computer visions or level five autonomous vehicles that can navigate roads and traffic systems all on their own. So autonomous AI will eventually revamp uh, all industries uh, from the ground up and changing the way how uh, we're going to work and live. So now uh, let's uh, revisit uh, Turing's questions of can uh, machines think? And we may find ourselves getting closer to the to answering the questions, um, but we are not still not there yet. So current air technologies uh, outperform humans, right? Uh, in fact, they, they do in many areas. However, uh, it is still far from competent, I would say, when dealing with uh, complicated issues uh, that involve philosophy, emotions, and ethics. So humans are still far more superior in the areas of uh, high-end thinking and interpersonal skills. So uh, I would say that for uh, an ideal strategy would be for the humans and machines working hand in hand, uh, taking advantages of uh, each other's strengths. And we can dedicate low level, high repetitive, uh, trivial and uninteresting works to the machines. And it will free us to uh, concentrate in more complex tasks. And at the same time, we also need a workforce who are capable in building, programming and developing AI technology. So uh, all in all, AI will definitely impact uh, the productivity uh, in a positive way and bring uh, in economic growth. But on the other hand, it will also uh, re-architect the workforce in a disruptive manner. So whether such uh, transformation will impact us positively or negatively has yet to be seen. And I would say the outcomes will mostly depend on how we react to such changes. And we will need to prepare ourselves in order to embrace and adapt to this disruptive uh, technology. And I have reached <laughs> the end of my presentation. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Dr. Sim. I think it's, it's definitely within integrated in our lives without us sometimes even realizing it, like, when ads follow us after we visit a website and we are haunted by, you know, to shop more at certain brands and things yes. like that. So... Yeah. The machines <laughs> and, know more than you. Than yeah, they know what you need before you know what you need. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Sim. And next up, we have uh, Mr. Olivier, Oliver Tian. He is the Honorary Advisor at Asia Pacific Assistive Robotics Association or short form APARA, and he's the founder of Oliver Tian Associates based in Singapore. So central to leveraging AI and robotics technologies to augment human capacity is the need to have the skills to understand and supervise the human machine combination. So Mr. Oliver Tan will be elaborating on some of the critical skills of the future, which will help technology users to understand, explore and leverage upon human capabilities and potential to be better. All right, so we shall let him present. Hello everyone, a very good afternoon to all of you. My name is Oliver Tien and I represent the Asia Pacific Assistive Robotics Association. It is my pleasure today to be able to share with you some of my opinions and ideas in regards to how AI and robotics will impact your life. Let me first thank the organizers for inviting me to make this presentation and more importantly, to talk about a very relevant topic which I've chosen for this presentation, skills of the future. Men, and machine augmentation. It is important that as we look at how AI and robotics impact our lives, 
we also must understand how the human learns and more importantly, how man and machine can augment each other for the battle of society. Now, let me begin. As we talk about the skills of the future, it is relevant that we also consider how the human learns. The different learning style will generate different outcome as we study and understand the adoption of technology. The human and machine collaboration will be an important consideration because as we detect what the future is going to look like, men will be working very closely with machine. But what is in the future? In 1995, Clifford Stowe wrote an article on Newsweek. He suggested, and I quote, if you really want to know about the future, don't ask a technologist, a scientist, or a physicist, unquote. What is going to happen and look like in 20 years' time? It is best to check out with the kindergarten teacher, the adult who spends much time within a day with the young ones, our next generation. They will know who they are, what the children is thinking about, what they wish to be, and how they intend to dream and shape the future. I hope AI do not end up changing the way we learn to an extent whereby we connect circuitries and wires to our head, to our brain, to in order to optimize learning. In fact, learning is not just pure knowledge base. It is a function of social connectedness, of social behavior, and how we engage with each other. All those three factors are critical, are crucial, in fact, to cooperate between humans among teams, to solve problems, and build creativity. There are probably a number of drivers that's changing and shaping our future. For one, technological breakthroughs. The rapid advancement in technological innovation, such as automation, robotics, and AI, are advancing very quickly and dramatically changing the nature and the type of jobs that we have in the future. There is also the consideration of demographic shifts. The changing size, distribution and age profile of a world population will also shape how our future will look like. The use of technology by these demographic groups will also determine the usability of such technologies. Then there is the issue of rapid urbanization. We are seeing a significant increase in the world population moving towards living in the city. By 2030, the UN projects that 4.9 billion people will be in urban environment. That means that as we start to look at how technology can be deployed for human use, we need to cater to the needs of both the urban lifestyle as well as the rural lifestyle. The two other factors that's going to shape the future is the shift in economic global power as well as resource scarcity and climate change. Those two will determine how and what technology should be adopted. In order to understand the human learning style, we need to understand what would the future of learning look like. There are many research that centers around the different learning aspects, and there are many research to explore technology in the discussion on the future of learning, we need to consider two perspectives. One is the competency that we want to build within the domains. This is commonly known as corporate training. The second is establishing the global norms as a foundation for the children to pick up necessary fundamental skills that can help them build agency and continue to be able to pick up new skills as they join the industry. In a report by the World Economic Forum on future of jobs, it has been noted that 50% of employees who are currently within the businesses needs to be reskilled by 2025. What is more important is that we are seeing more and more of a need to have the skill in the area of human-machine collaboration. 
Of course, critical thinking and problem solving top the list of skills as needed. Combining all this together will allow us to explore new models of humans and machine collaborating for higher productivity, efficiency, and harmony. Another observation is that the single skill set jobs are going to be on a decline. In a study by Oxford University, it was observed that workers who successfully combine skills in science, mathematics, and engineering together with strong interpersonal skills in knowledge based economy are starting to show very important relevance. The report also suggests 10 very essential skills for future workforce. Let's take a close look. And we will realize that out of the 10 skills, six of them will be relevant to man and machine collaboration. For example, design mindset, virtual collaboration, and social intelligence suggest that there is a need to build solutions where human and machine can co-work together. But in the augmentation of human capabilities, what are we looking for? Well, first, let's understand the strength of the human which cannot be duplicated. We're good with curiosity. We ask questions. We look out for more things. We have a conscience. We know what's good and bad and how to be ethical and responsible. And finally, we have a strong sense of creativity. On the other hand, if I look at the strength of the computer or the machine, they possess speed. They can have a multitude of storage space. And more importantly, the collection of data from different points vastly can be put together and help human with reasoning. So if you combine the powers of curiosity, conscience, creativity, and on the other side, speed, storage, and sensing, it is definitely required for skills of the future to embrace those qualities in order to understand, in order to leverage AI and robotic technologies that will impact our life. But then again, it's not so simple, right? Um, if we look at the technology behind the robot, the skill set that are needed clearly goes beyond single discipline. Let's take the robot for example. For the robot to effectively and efficiently work with humans, there are multiple competency and knowledge that has to be embedded. Motion technology, ability to process visual inputs, goal setting, responding with the respective actions, the ability to predict the next course of action and to respond accordingly, and so on and so forth. It is not like simply ask the machine to imitate what you do and the machine learns what to do. Because at the end of the day, for each of the actions that we humans take, there is a corresponding objective we want to achieve. So a robot requires multidisciplinary collaboration and is indeed a much bigger project than expected. Here are some examples that I'd like to share. How men and machine are collaborating together in the factory on the shop floor. But particularly, I'd like to highlight the picture on the bottom right. You see a man performing his task. His eyes are on what he's doing, but he stretches out his hand for the robot to supply him with a component that he can use um, in executing his job. That level of trust between man and machine and how they're able to collaborate together is fundamentally where true collaboration takes place. Fundamentally, this is where when you work with a co-worker and over time you have that frictionless flow of work that allows you to be efficient. Are we able to trust machine? Are we able to have the machine built to extend where they can anticipate and understand what the human need in order to collaborate? That becomes a big question. The workforce of the future will comprise both men 
and machine. The human workforce and the digital workforce combining together will form the future workplace. And this is very important. And hence, future skills will have to embrace how we can understand, leverage, and supervise machines. In talking about the digital workforce, there are three levels of effectiveness it refers to assisted intelligence. And this technology is quite widely available today. The goal is to improve what people and organizations are already doing and achieve greater efficiency. The second is augmented intelligence. An emerging area, the intention is to help people and organization do things that they couldn't otherwise do. And that's important because if we have a digital workforce, a smart co-worker, they need to be able to dovetail and supplement what the human capability can do or for that matter, can that do. At the second level, we talk about augmented intelligence. And this is an emerging area. The intent is to help people and organizations do things that they couldn't otherwise do. And this is important because this will give you the multiplier to ensure a better workflow and more importantly, increase productivity multifold. At the ultimate, we are talking about developing a technology which establishes machines to act on their own. Some early examples of this include self-driving vehicles. In the aspect enable work to be automated, a report by Willis Towers and Watson suggests that there are probably two factors to consider, the maturity of the task and the impact of the task. Well, if you look at routine and high volume tasks today, clearly this is a great target for automation. And robot process automation is an example of how the digital workforce is coming to play. In the second area where we look at non-routine and creative tasks, this is probably difficult at this point in time with current technology to achieve, but we are talking about connective automation using strong AI, using deep learning, and more importantly, creating a high impact on the outcome. What we're also seeing is an area where it's routine and collaborative. Man and machine working together with high impact on the performance outcomes. And these are the areas where social robots exist. With that discussion around collaborative design and how human and machines are going to work together, perhaps someone may ask, we may not need all those technology, so why bother? Let me refer you to Gary Gosparov. Now, as all of you would know, Gary Gosparov was the first chess world champion to eventually lose to a machine. That happened in 1997. And now, about 24 years later, AI has become a lot more superior and can create a much more impact on our lives compared to a quarter century ago. So when he was recently interviewed, the question is, do we need less technology? His response was very clear. We actually need better humans and not less technology. The rapid wave of human-like AI will put us out of job if we do not become better humans. We need to upskill. We need to understand and learn the technology, appreciate how to leverage technology in order to use the technology to augment our capability. And to do so, we have to get better with what we are doing. You have to get better in order to supervise the machines that is supporting us. That brings me to a discussion around human factor engineering. Well, the graphic I'm showing now is very easily understood. How can you use techniques and technology to give you higher quality of life? 
if the objective is to transport two pillars from one point to another point, and you have the option of creating um, a solution to help you support that, do you carry it based on your master strength? Or do you build a solution that the humans can use in collaboration to transport the object to the destination? Human-centered engineering will be very key and the design of solution will depend on how much we can leverage human factor engineering. This is going to be an important skill to be able to design solution using technology and be able to ensure that this technology is here to support us. There are many ways that AI and robots can make our human life more easy. We can choose to do so, and to do so, we need to understand the technology. Technology comes across with three key fundamental principles that we can leverage. One, the connectedness of technology. It's making the world smaller because it's so much easier for you to reach somebody on the other side of the globe. There can also be further collaboration on where the strength of the human lies and where the strength of the machine lies. This will enable us to achieve more. And together with machines, we hope that we can co-create new innovations. We can build solutions that can support our human life, increase the quality of life, and perhaps even do more with less. The importance of human factor engineering cannot be underestimated. The benefit in human factor design in improving technology to a level where human and machine interactions become efficient and ultimately become pleasant is a very important one. There is a quote that I share with my clients. The best technology ever, if not usable by the human beings, is probably the worst of technology. The benefits of having human factor in the design process to enable proper human and machine augmentation is key to the success of our future and key to the success of our upgrading human skills so that we can enjoy a better quality of life. The whole discussion on how to leverage technology can be a lengthy one. Perhaps we shouldn't talk about it in this presentation, but I wanted to highlight that the future of work is going to be in technology. And it is important that technology leaders have to reimagine how the technologies can work for us. How can we upskill the workforce to leverage on the technology? And how do we reimagine the use of the workspace to support us to achieve better? Well, with that, I end my presentation. Um, APAR is an organization that believes in collaboration, particularly for a common cause on practical projects. Together, we hope to build a leading platform for innovation, adoption, and augmentation of intelligent robotic technology for the digital community. Um, that's the landscape of Singapore, and uh, we do welcome anybody who wants to uh, join us, work with us, uh, and build effective solution. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Oliver Tian. Uh, my contact is on um, the screen. So please stay healthy, keep safe, and have a wonderful seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Um, and yes, we shouldn't be too worried about robots taking over our jobs. We should be thinking about working together to make things much easier and faster and more efficient. Uh, up next, we have Myra's member, Myra's CEO, My, Myra's VP, Mr. Suho Hock Ming. Uh, he's the CEO of Avantgarde Center of Excellence, Sinan Berhad. He is a self-styled technology enthusiast, and he will touch on the physical aspect of robots. So to optimize the desired tasks and outcomes, the form factor of robots influence psychological perception and acceptance while functionally impact, impacting delivery effectiveness and productivity. So he will be speaking about collaborative robots for SMEs. Mr. Su, your stage is yours. Thank you, Hannes. Uh, I'll try to share my screen. 
Can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it is, uh, I thank you, um, Tan Sri and uh, CS for, for the introduction. And especially I thank uh, Professor Sim and Oliver for setting the scene. Uh, it's been quite a interesting journey uh, preparing for this uh, particular seminar. Uh, I will speak particularly on collaborative, collaborative robots for SMEs. A uh, very quick introduction to uh, AGCOE, Avant-Garde Center of Excellence. Our main uh, goal in life is to really bring technologies to Malaysia, to bring collaboration, and um, to be part of the technology ecosystem uh, for Malaysia. A uh, very quick introduction to our commercial partners, our strategic partners, as well as our association partners. So thank you very much. This is my first recollection of a, a robot. I, it it kind of shows my age because this is the robot from uh, the original Lost in Space series on, on TV. And um, my m recollection of this particular robot is that it was designed to protect humans. It, in, in whatever it did, it always protected this particular human called Will Robinson. And um, it, it kind of sets the scene in terms of expectations, at least in my mind, of robots. Going through the evolution of uh, industrial robots, uh, industrial robots have gone, th gone through a, a very profound change. Uh, the first robot was patented in 1954, and General Motors um, was the first user of the robot. If you look at the picture of the, of the robot on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, it bears no resemblance to the industrial robots that we see today. It, it is quite um, limited in terms of its, of its structure, uh, and it is very boxy. If you look down on, on the bottom right, this, this is a kind of a, a line for the modern industrial robots. And what we have seen is over the um, decades, an increase in the use of industrial robots. And what characterizes the industrial robots is that they are very high or very large machines with very high payloads. So they tend to be used in heavy industries, in the automotive industry, in industries where the payload is very high, uh, very suitable for large-scale manufacturing enterprises, and very often tends to use proprietary languages and control systems. In our experience uh, dealing with different universities, we have found that they have purchased large industrial machines, which are very much now kept in uh, cold storage. Uh, but the main feature of these robots is the safety cages. They do not allow human to robot interaction because they do not have the uh, sensors that detect the human being and uh, any human being who gets in the way uh, of his programming algorithm will just no longer exist or be hurt quite badly. Uh, and that, that is one really major feature of industrial robots. Uh, they are very high in terms of capital costs, very high in terms of maintenance costs, and for SMEs tend not to be a very suitable solution. In 1996, the first collaborative robot um, came into existence. Uh, and over the years, the collaborative robot has actually evolved quite considerably. And this, the main difference between a collaborative robot and an industrial robot is that it is really intended for direct human robot interactions within, um, within a shared space. So the human and robots can work together. And, and uh, what Oliver showed in one of his slides was, is very, very much uh, indicative where the human has no fear of the robot. And in fact, it helps augment the, um, 
whatever the human is doing on on the production line uh, it doesn't it's not the robot is not isolated from the human but actually works together so so the term collaborative uh, robot so just going through very quickly the difference between the large scale industrial robots and the uh, the cobot um, like i mentioned it was industrial robots tend to be very large scale uh, caged high cost that is not to detract from the functional benefits of industrial robots in a production line where you have high volume large items industrial robots actually are very very effective they can deliver high levels of productivity that a, hum uh, a human uh, production line cannot deliver um, however for the sme is not and not really suitable whereas for smes in terms of the scale it's actually more cost effective uh, to use collaborative robots where the human ro robot interaction is uh, is required uh, there's a much lower cost in terms of uh, purchase and integration uh, obviously sme friendly and really drives productivity because it works together with the human it augments the human and delivers value and especially where we are dealing with uh, high intense intensive intensity of i'm trying to find a new word of uh, human uh, labor requirement i'll just do a very quick uh, introduction um Dubot is our strategic partner in terms of uh, collaborative robots. And this, this is the range of uh, robots that we have. Uh, we have the, uh, the CR series. Uh, then we have the M1, which is Scala. And then we have the two uh, Dubots, the smaller machi machines, the MG400 and the uh, Magician. These are desktop versions of uh, four axis robots. They are co collaborative because uh, the minute the they, they come in contact with a human worker or human touch, it will stop. And then it will continue once it's restarted again. Um, the CR series is really one of, the, in terms of its positioning, it's positioned to be able to compete with existing uh, cobots in the marketplace at a very cost effective price. I think I skipped a slide. This is just, I'll run through this very quickly. All the uh, different uh, users of the, uh, of the cobot. Uh, I won't play the full, full video, just, just an introductory video. So this is uh, a cobot on a AGV or AMR, uh, where it can actually move from one one part of the plant to another plant in in order to fulfill this task this is not a specialized welding robot but has a flexibility to be able to do welding uh, this is a very simple ap application which is really to uh, put adhesive on a drum in order for for labels And even moving into the realm of uh, automotive assembly, um, it actually has the flexibility and ability to be part of uh, assembly site, uh, assembly line uh, in terms of uh, replacing repetitive tasks that a human being uh, would generally have to do. Uh, this is a food and beverage in a food manufacturing sector. This is basically just preparing cartons. Uh, this is a uh, pack pallet placement. It's a part of a packing line. And last but not least, uh, this shows its flexibility uh, to be used in agriculture. Okay. Sorry. 
Yeah. So um, basically, the takeaway of uh, collaborative robots is that it is uh, basically a very low cost uh, alternative to um, industrial robots, highly flexible. As you can see, it is e very easy to use across many different production processes, very easy to program, easy to adapt, because we can just it can be placed on a AGV or AMR. Um, the end effector has there's a multiple end effectors available for whatever end use the intention it is intended for. It can be used in a wide range of range of industries from light to heavy. Uh, can be used in all stages of the uh, manufacturing process from the very beginning uh, stage of. Uh, easy assembly right through to warehousing and really very much in terms of uh, dependence on um, labor it can replace a lot of the tasks that uh, that it is difficult to obtain uh, labor for um, you know uh, Tan Sri mentioned things like dirty uh, dangerous repetitive tasks and this is where uh, a collaborative robot comes in into its into its form uh, into its functional benefits. Just to go very quickly, uh, we, we, there are also much lower cost um, robots for SMEs. The MG400 is actually a simple four axis robot, which can be used in a production line. And this is actually being used in a real production line in Thailand for automotive parts. So is, instead of a human being, for example, taking the part out of the uh, stamping machine, which is actually a very dangerous task because uh, I'm sure we have seen videos of workers having their hands um, hurt as a result. This actually takes away the risk to the human of uh, dealing with dangerous tasks. In, in food, Manufacturing, um, it can also perform similar tasks. So instead of a human being doing the repetitive task, the robot can actually perform the task. And really, the magician itself was introduced as uh, an education uh, robot. And and even though it found started life as um, as a edu education product. But end of it, industry has found many, many uses for it, uh, similar to the MG400, because it can basically do repetitive tasks uh, at a much lower cost and lower risk. So this is a, a very simple task, which is really putting strips of uh, medicine into, into packs. Right. It can do all this at a much lower cost and a higher speed than the, than the human. And um, I can say this: this is actually Adidas in um, in Indonesia, where it is used to apply adhesive onto parts of the shoe. And the last one is actually, uh, again, automotive industry. You, you will notice that it is actually integrated with uh, PLCs. So all these robots are quite easily integratable into existing uh, production lines that run PLCs. Okay, uh, just very quickly, these are, are the other use cases for the magician. Uh, very, very simple, repetitive task, but uh, very much value added. Okay, so this is probably my last slide already. And I just want to summarize everything from, uh, from this particular presentation. We, I mentioned I spoke about the industrial robots. I spoke about the uh, SME and what, what the collaborative robot actually provides us is the springboard because it is actually only the beginning building block 
for SMEs. When we talk about IR 4.0, we are, we are looking at not just where we are now, but where we want to be. Um, how, how do we integrate AI into manufacturing? How do we integrate uh, improved work processes into manufacturing? And this is where collaborative robots actually form the, the backbone of the, the, new, the new industrial process. What, what the collaborative robots open the industry for is really moving into collaborative cell manufacturing, where we integrate cobots with <clears throat> AMRs, sorry, I, I, there's a typo here, uh, and exoskeletons, where we can actually have a complete flow from beginning to end using these tools which are available to us. Uh, we can also, uh, humans come in and to prevent injury, we can have, we will have exoskeletons. We, we can actually design uh, cell manufacturing in order to speed up product production process. We can actually reduce the batch sizes and be more flexible. We are dealing with an environment where people are looking for more customized more specialized products that will suit their requirements. Uh, additive manufacturing is one, one route of manufacturing. However, additive manufacturing has its own limitations. Collaborative cell manufacturing actually allows SMEs to be highly flexible. They are using AI, they can forecast requirements, demand requirements, and then be able to adjust their production very, very quickly because it is so easy to program a collaborative robot. You can pre-program all the recipes and then as and when required, adjust the production flow, adjust the production cell in order to meet customer requirements. And really this is where SMEs have the leverage. In the past, they, they were stuck in large scale, high speed, high volume manufacturing, uh, but low value added. This is where they can move up the manufacturing uh, chain and move into high value, highly customized products to meet customer requirements. Ming, we are running a bit uh, behind time. Okay, so I'm done. Okay, <laughs> Thank <great>. you very <laughs> much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much. So if you'd like to get in touch with Ming, um, you can leave a message, of course, in the chat and we can continue from there. Next up, we will have um, the last but not least, TS Dr. Chua Wenxian. He's the head of Malaysian Smart Factory 4.0 um, from the Selangor Human, Human Resource Development Center, SHRDC. He's currently the head uh, basically, his, his expertise lies sorry, mainly in the area of control and automation systems, fault detection and identification, FDI, and predictive maintenance strategies, which are widely used in industry 4.0 applications. So today, he'll be providing an overview of AI strategies, industrial applications towards the enablement of smart factory and provide insights and a unique perspective towards enabling a sustainable AI adoption for industrial applications. The floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you very much um, uh, to the moderator, Hanis. And also thank you very much, everyone, for uh, joining in the session today. I think I believe this is a very, very interesting session where we um, talk about um, you know, AI and also uh, robotics. And I believe um, this is a very, very interesting session for us all. And my slides are up. Everyone can see. Right? All good? Yep. So thank you very much, everyone, once again, for joining in this session on this um, lovely um, Thursday afternoon. So my name is Dr. Chua, and I represent the Malaysian Smart Factory 4.0 uh, under the Selangor Human Resource Development Center. Uh, the Malaysian Smart Factory 4.0 generally works on um, emerging technologies towards um, industrialization 4.0 and helps many, many industries in this space achieve sustainable digital transformation. 
right? And, and one of the key aspects, I believe, uh, for us moving forward is, of course, ensuring a more uh, smooth AI adoption uh, for the industries in Malaysia. And hence, that's where uh, my title of the discussion today would be sustainable AI adoption for industrial applications, right? So the importance of data is very, very um, widely um, discussed nowadays, right? Uh, whenever we talk about industrialization 4.0, uh, it's no longer about automation anymore. It's no longer about mass production anymore. It's now the utilization of data to make better decisions and to, of course, provide better visualization of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And data is how you actually uh, create more intelligent systems, right? Uh, through what uh, Professor Sim has discussed just now on, you know, machine learning, deep learning. These are how uh, our machines learn, right? And they learn it from data, right? So the, the key strength of Industry 4.0 really lies in the aspect of the data that we collect on a day-to-day -day basis, regardless whether is it numerical data, whether is it, um, you know, uh, data from images, data from videos, data from t uh, speech or text, it doesn't matter, right? Data is data no matter where we, what, how we collect it. And this is how we can structure it to provide us with not only information, but also knowledge and wisdom, right? When you have enough data, when you have enough, um, you know, information that are collected on a day-to-day -day basis, what happens next is basically you use this data to create intelligent systems, right? For example, uh, a very, very easy example that I always um, share with many of the industries is that, you know, uh, when, the first thing that you do when you leave the house is that you will open up ways and check the traffic jam, right? So when you, when you look at that, that are data collected on a day-to-day -day basis or even in real time to predict what is the possible estimated time of arrival for you to reach where you want to go, right? And what are the best routes to take, um, you know, that has been, um, you know, clear of traffic or as minimal traffic as possible for you to get to your destination that the fastest way possible, right? So these are how data are used on a day-to-day -day basis to predict or to estimate what is going to be the next step, hence creating wisdom, right? Um, if you shop in Lazada, if you shop in Shopee, right, you will notice that if you search for a vacuum cleaner, everything else will give you suggestive posts of a vacuum cleaner. Is that straightforward, right? So, so this is all realizable through the data that we collect on a day-to-day basis and also based on the behavior of what you, you press, what you, what you insert, Right, all these are data collected on a day-to-day -day basis to provide better intelligence to the systems. Now, in the manufacturing industry or in, in a, a production industry in general, what happens is that you know, to reach to that level of intelligence, there is a, a lot of steps to go right before you reach there. Right? When we talk about data, you need to collect it almost in real time. Right? You need to automate data collection. It's not just data collection by writing down on a piece of paper, transferring it into Excel sheet, and then transferring it into a database, that's gonna be a very, very long process. And there's always a chance of data manipulation. There's always a chance where there is data loss that we don't know, right? So what you need to do is, of course, to look into digitalization, right? Uh, computerization, connectivity, that is one of the key aspects as you move along this um, digital transformation pathway. Now, what is the first step of data that is going to be used for you would be to, to identify what is happening, right? Then that data is then used to identify why is it happening, what will happen next, and of course, the last part will be how can we improve on it? And this is basically how data are used to create visibility, transparency, predictive capacity, and of course, eventually adaptability. That's where the intelligence will come in, right? Now, when we talk about data, we talk about the four types of data analytics, right? We talk about descriptive, right? That, uh, that provides you with information of what is happening to your business. Diagnostics, why is it happening? Predictive, what's likely to happen? And of course, prescriptive, what do I need to do, right? And, and if you notice this chart, the value from descriptive to prescriptive um, increases over time. But the complexity itself also increases as you move from descriptive to diagnostic to predictive and prescriptive. And when it gets more complex, of course, the more value that you will get, right? The more impact that you'll create because you create more intelligent systems for yourself. Now, the next key portion is how do we get that? 
how do we really realize that kind of AI adoption or that kind of digital transformation adoption over time, right? It's really about taking the step of just collecting data, right? And nowadays, when, when we talk about, um, you know, collection of data, it's no longer a very, very difficult step, nor is it a very expensive step, right? There are a lot of tools nowadays to just um, insert or to just create and just visualize the data directly, right? So, so for example, what we have done uh, for many companies is that, you know, they want to look at what their data is every day. They want to see their trends. They want to identify their gaps. So what they have done is basically they learn how to integrate these technologies and then they go back and they put in these technologies and then they start to see what is really happening in their production line, right? And, and by just looking at it, right, they start to see, you know, they start to understand why is it really happening, right? They start to see gaps. They start to identify difficult uh, issues that they have never seen before. And, you know, putting in the right sensor technologies, putting in the right, um, you know, um, systems in place will help them to realize more information of what they want to see. So then they start to go deeper into the root cause with that which is diagnostic analytics, right? And, and nowadays, even coding, right? Or, or we call it low code, no code platforms are so apparent out there, right? That anybody can actually develop systems like this, anybody, right? It really depends on how much effort you put in and how much passion that you have to really realize this kind of adoption, right? And we have seen many industries that have um, started this journey to really realize their, their potential, right? Through, through implementing these technologies. Now, once you understand why is it happening, now the next step is to then put in the right strategies to determine what is likely to happen, right? And this is where, you know, key strengths of predictive maintenance, anomaly detection, right? And, and you know, we talk about forecasting, right? We talk about estimation. This is where, um, you know, AIs are implemented to actually do forecasting of what is likely to happen based on historical data. And from there, you get to identify anomalies because, you know, it's, you, you get to see like the current trend is very different from what you forecast it to be, right? And, and that's where you start to see that there is a problem, right? That's where you start to realize that using AI and predictive analytics are able to help you to identify issues of the future, right? And, and this is actually one of the key strength of how AI adoption can support your implementation, right? And you know what, what is likely to happen over here as well, um, if you can see from this, um, this particular graph here, is that instead of just looking at time series data, you can also, you know, capture images and you can straight away identify what is good and bad directly through computer vision inspections, right? And this kind of AI adoption is not difficult to achieve, right? And in fact, if you start to see this, this is actually utilizing data from a machine, right? We, I always say that when you collect data from a machine like this, you are actually monitoring the heartbeat of the machine, right? Every machine has a heartbeat, right? Uh, even human beings has a heartbeat. So if you think about it, right, um, you know, this can actually be used for medical technology, right? It can also be used for any kind of technology, right? And AI adoption is across industrial sectors, right? And of course, when you start to look at, you know, more and more data being collected, you start to see um, more and more, um, you know, models being generated to represent or to model your factory or process or even machines, start to create your digital model, your digital factory. That's where prescriptive analytics come in, right? Based on historical data, you're actually pushing it through a model process. You're actually able to visualize your digital factory, your digital model, and start to do forecasting, projection, you know, start to realize better potential, optimize your processes based on the information that you have on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is how you can achieve that four levels of data analytics as you go on through your uh, journey of implementing AI eventually, right? Now, a lot of advantages that we know, you know, that comes out of AI adoption or digital transformation, right? We get to reduce costs, right? Reduce losses. That's uh, definitely one of the key aspects, increase competitiveness, uh, we become more efficient, we become more optimized. But the next question is, how do you really get there, right? And, and a lot of times, um, we, we, many industries start it at the, 
at not a very right step, right? I would say that they try to, to run before they can, you know, before they can walk. And that's where, you know, they lose motivation. And that's where they, they start to see that, hey, you know, maybe AI is very complex. I, this is not something that I want to do. Um, digital transformation, mm, it seems very complex. Maybe I'll just write it on a piece of paper and I already do it anyways, right? So hence it comes to a more bite-sized and sustainable approach when it comes to adoption, right? It's very, very important to, to do it as a step-by-step -step, rather than, you know, put it on the table and say, okay, take this all, um, you know, this, this whole project, um, you know, this is going to get you from end to end and this is the big total cost that you're going to pay for, right? So we always like to go on a bite-sized approach, right? Start small, but scale big, right? Understand what is AI really all about, right? Whereby it's a combination of, you know, machine learning or deep learning, depending on what your use case and application is, right? Start by building your own domain experts, right? I could never see how an industry can really apply AI or machine learning moving forward without the right people, right? Uh, you probably can, but it's going to be very, very costly. Why? Because nobody knows your data better than you, right? Nobody knows your um, trends of production or your manufacturing better than you, right? You are the domain expert. Your people are the domain expert. And that's why it is so important to have the right people in your factory or in, in any of your organization to implement this kind of AI adoption, right? Or digital transformation adoption. And this is how we have encouraged many, many industries to get started, right? And by doing that, to start building your roadmap first, right? Um, for industries, right, um, we understand that many people are very excited about technologies, right? They're very excited about what technology can do for them. But the main key problem lies in the leadership buy-in, right? Um, we have discussed with many companies many, many times, right? And we noticed that, you know, um, the moment the bosses start to step into our smart factory to have a look at how it is and understand how it can be adopted, almost immediately projects will start, right? The transformation will start. So leadership buy-in is a real key important step when it comes to transformation. Whether is it digital transformation, AI adoption is all about the leadership buy-in. And then slowly you move towards building your, your people competencies, your lighthouse project, developing ambassadors and then start to move forward and scale up. Now, if you notice that the last point of it is not just to stop there and that's about it, right? You talk about continuous improvement, you know, talk about in, uh, continuously upgrading yourself to scale up further. So for many, many industries, especially the SMEs, we sort of broken down, um, you know, this kind of uh, maturity levels right here from level one to level six, right? Why, why we did this is because we notice that many of the industries um, want to get to AI, want to get to analytics, but they don't even generate data. They don't even generate anything. They don't even know anything about their, their data before they want to get there, right? So we, we get them through a more step-by-step -step approach, right? So generate data, visualize, level one, level two, store, level three, four to formulate, five to analyze in data analytics, then six go into AI. Right, it's a modular approach. It's very bite-sized, right? You you can just get one side, feel feel that this is something for you, then scale up further, right? And and this can actually be achieved, right? Um, it's it's a very unique model that we have worked out in such a way where you can actually achieve AI adoption or digital transformation in a very bite-sized approach, right? Um, through just going through talent development programs. Right, it's it's a very very different approach as compared to okay, this is a technology you can use it, please um you know uh pay for it and then you can directly use it. But instead, we go through a talent approach whereby you understand the technology, you understand what it really is, and when you adopt it, when you implement it, you know what you are doing, right? And this creates a greater motivation to adopt technologies. And, you know, many industries that I've worked with um, that I see have gone through this pathway, um, they are very, very motivated to do the next step, right? And this is how we create that kind of um, sustainable loop of adoption uh, because, you know, we need to keep people motivated. We need to keep people excited about technology, right? And the only way to do that is that they are involved in this development, right? 
And now these AI technologies are not difficult to implement. And if you think that you need to be a Python programmer, you need to be a Java programmer to do AI, it's not necessary, right? Now there are so many drag and drop tools that are out there. You can directly utilize, build your own AI models and then deploy it. We call them citizen developers, right? And, and this has actually brought rise to many people who are not from the technical programming background to be able to do real technical work, right? And, and that's where the, the multidisciplinary skills and cross competencies come in, right? And you may not have an engineering background, you may not have a software engineering background, but you have great mathematical background, you can still build AI models, right? But most importantly, whenever it comes to any kind of adoption, it needs to be sustainable, right? You need to ensure that, you know, whatever you invest in are modular, compatible, they are scalable, we really like to work with um, open technologies, community-driven technologies, because we believe that the growth of technology lies with the people, right? And, and with this kind of community-driven tools, that's where we all grow together, right? Imagine all the AI models and libraries are all proprietary, that then we don't get to enjoy what technology is helping us to go forward, right? So, so this is how we want to encourage um, universities, right? Uh, academics, we work with a lot of universities, uh, to actually drive this kind of adoption. And, and we want to continue to help the industries in this manner to create more va maximum value creation and transformation ownership for the organizations, right? So um, if, if you're in Malaysia, right, uh, uh, you, please do come and visit the Malaysian Smart Factory. This is where we are. We are located in Selangor, Shah Alam, right? Um, if you are not in Malaysia yet, right, due to border constraints, um, you can, of course, come and have a look at our virtual tour, right? Um, this is a very humble space where we showcase technologies together with our 26 technology partners, right? Uh, and this is how we help many industries to realize um, their dream of digital transformation moving forward, right? Uh, we are a quick shout out that we are also supporting um, this program on Data Camp Donates, right? Uh, this is actually one of the key collaborations of how we help many people adopt AI faster, right? So if, if, you are a, if you are a student, right, um, that is looking to, to take up data camp, please do get in touch with us, right? So with that, uh, that's all I have for this afternoon. Thank you very much. And I hope my presentation was um, uh, useful for many of the people that attended today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chua. Um, thank you for staying on till the end of the presentations um, we will be now get uh, re waiting for your questions for our panelists do leave your questions in the q a section uh, i have actually received some questions so maybe we can go with uh, let me see dr sim since you know uh, you went first um okay so how can we prepare ourselves for the ai disruption Right. So uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, I think I've mentioned uh, in my presentations uh, that actually uh, machines and humans can work hand in hand, uh, in particular in the areas of uh, interpersonal skills. Okay. So uh, the other thing is actually about we also need uh, developers in building this AI system as well. So it depends on uh, which areas that you'll be interested in. So if you are a software developer uh, and AI person, then you may want to actually upskill and reskill yourself uh, in, into that. But if you're not, then most likely you should look into the areas where you uh, where humans perform the best, which is the interpersonal skills. So this is my advice uh, on uh, how we can actually prepare ourselves. And also I think we shouldn't be too worried about uh, machines taking over our jobs. So I think at the moment, I think a lot of observation has been made that actually machines or AI actually is uh, doing tasks rather than jobs, right? Uh, which is there very uh, well. So uh, again, we will need uh, to find a ways. Uh, so like, for example, uh, if you see this, uh, I just watched a, a video not long ago on YouTube that uh, China's that deploying this uh, self-driving bus. But you still uh, need a human operators in there <laughs> to actually yeah to to take care of it. So this is how uh, uh, our jobs has been evolving. So if you are a bus driver, you think your driving skill is actually uh, very good, but then now you have to learn another skill is actually how to operate a computer, right? In driving a bus, yeah. 
So this is the, some things that we need to uh, be prepared for. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, can I just add, add one yes. thing? Uh, Tan Sri mentioned that, um, you know, uh, that the tasks that robots can take over are the dangerous and, um, and, and the difficult tasks. Um, we've had a conversation with one of the largest bus operators in, in Malaysia. And um, we were told that there's at least one bus driver who dies of heart attack every week. So it is a very stressful and very dangerous task, uh, even though it doesn't seem that way. Uh, so the use of uh, autonomous bus, for example, is actually beneficial because it saves lives. And they actually used it in uh, Japan for the recent Olympics. So that was quite cool. Um, quite scary also if you don't know which bus to get on. Um, <laughs> get on somewhere else. Okay, since um, then you're on in your on board, I'm going to ask you the next question. How difficult is it to find engineers and technicians to implement, operate, and maintain cobots? There is um, an, a capability gap at the moment, but uh, it's being uh, closed very quickly. There are uh, from the technical side, uh, the universities and, and even SHRDC are already working in terms um, of producing that level of capability. Uh, in fact, uh, to do a bit of a plug-in, uh, SHRDC and AGCOE are actually in the process of putting together a program to build that, cap that very capability, both in terms of uh, uh, programming and and eventually we'll go into the maintenance aspects as well. So a bit of commercial. <laughs> All right, thanks Ming. <laughs> we had a question, uh, hold on. Uh, we had a question for Oliver, actually. Um, if, if it's actually, is AI adoption difficult? He has replied in chat, um, start small. AI doesn't have to be a big project. So build early success to establish confidence, understand the appropriate use of the technology and not the media hype. Yeah, because, you know, sometimes, you know, it's like hangat, hangat, I, I am, right? People want to, to just adopt for the sake of adopting and they don't know what they're doing. So I guess it's just to really know what your purpose is and what you're trying to automate before you jump onto the, the bandwagon. Um, we've got another question. Uh, and this is open to anybody who wants to answer. How relevant is robotics to a country such as Cambodia with a low cost labor force and a large rural population? <laughs> anybody want to answer that? <laughs> Can I just answer very quickly? Okay. Um, I think it's, it's very relevant. Uh, two things. One is that it enables a country like Cambodia to leapfrog from the current level of technology from labor intensive to uh, 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 automation intensive uh, in uh, industrial platform. But more importantly, it enables a country like Cambodia to leapfrog the capability gap, to build that capability that is, um, uh, that, that is missing. I mean, to give an example, right? <clears throat> uh, Myanmar, many years ago, when when uh, when I first visited Myanmar, to even get a, a, a mobile phone was like a real struggle. You know, you, you have to pay the military. Ex sorry, uh, I'll probably get banned by the by the military. But you, you have to pay a lot of money to get a, a, a mobile phone. And then they leapfrog into uh, 3G, 4G technology. And what what happened is not just the the uh, the, the technological gap being 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 lap frog, but also the capability gap because then a lot of new jobs in terms of technical uh, maintenance, uh, programming, setting up, you know, all, all the basic infrastructure, uh, they basically went from very low capability to very high capability in a very short time, and. This is the same thing that will happen in, let's say, a country like Cambodia or any country that uh, is very uh, labor intensive. What they will find is that they will move from low value to high value jobs. Uh, they will move from low, low value to high value manufacturing uh, in a very short time. 
Sorry, that's my five cents worth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. And we've got a question for Dr. Chua. Um, can we adopt AI technologies if we are not from a pro programming background? Uh, yes, you can, uh, definitely. And uh, we have seen many, many people that we work with um, that actually are able to do that, right? Um, we, we run programs that are um, very low code to no code programming, right? It's all drag and drop. Um, people actually learn faster through, um, through drag and drop programming, right? And, and that, is, um, that is really, I think, the way many people are going forward with because they want more people to adopt technology. Um, in fact, I have seen a video where you compare building a website uh, from a low code perspective and a real coding perspective to build a website. The one that actually knows the no code way uh, actually builds it in three days. The other oh. person actually builds it in a week, right? And it's still not working, right? <laughs> Even though it's a week. So you can yeah. see how different that accelerates the, the speed of, of um, adoption, right? Mm. And, um, you know, we, we also run many programs whereby, you know, uh, people from technical and non-technical background come and learn about IoT, mm. right? And, and we always think that IoT is only for engineers, right? But we had accountants that join our program, right? And you'll be very surprised, right, that the, the accountant actually passed our assessment, mm. right? And, and the one with, with, without, uh, with the technical background actually was struggling. Ah. So you can see, you can see that, that um, adoption of technology does not really depend on your background. It depends highly on your passion to learn mm -hmm. and the effort that you are willing to take to, to you know, go into the new technologies moving forward. So yeah, you, you can learn um, technology even though you're not from a programming background. Great. Gives me hope. Just to add one thing to what Dr... Uh, Chua said, mm -hmm. I, I'm, a, I'm an ex-accountant, ex so I guess accountants are not as dumb as they seem. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and even so, right, um, you know, Dubot actually has that broccoli kind of programming, which, which actually is a plus point, right, for, for, for anyone who wants to program a collaborative robot. Right, you don't need to learn how to code, you just need to know how logical it is to move a robot, right? And, and that actually speeds up a lot of process moving forward. Right. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Chua. Please. We've got a question from Terence. Um, can AI or drones be used to inspect for defects and identify defects on tall structures that are dangerous for humans to do so? For instance, defects on tall wind turbine structures. I think this one will be better suited for Dr. Sim to answer. Yes, I think the answer is yes. Yeah, and so there are the <laughs> software and actually system out there who's doing this for like, uh, we call it uh, this uh, infrastructures uh, or building inspections. So uh, these drones actually, drone is just basically a platform. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's used to carry a cameras or maybe some sensors, right? So uh, after we collect the data, so what most important is actually the software, uh, which is used to actually analyze this. So um, it's already happening. So definitely the answer is yes for that purpose. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we've seen it for, for telco towers as well. Um, they even go into pipelines, oil and gas, uh, sniffing out leaks and things like that. So yeah, drones can do a lot of stuff, Terence. Um, okay, so I think we, are, we have got 10 minutes before we close. Are there any questions that you'd like to ask the panelists before we go into our closing address by Mr. L.K. Wong? Any last questions? If there are none, then I suppose we can... Let me see, is anybody typing, typing? Nobody, right? Okay, uh, hi, Hanis, I saw Karen. She raised... Oh, Karen? All yeah. right. Karen, would you like to leave your question in the question section? Do you know where that is? It's at the bottom of the screen. Karen, you stayed with us all the way. That's great. You didn't have to sneak out halfway. <laughs> there is a question. I think she's typing in. in. Karen, type your question. Ah, there you go. Oh, no questions. I just guess she's just excited and happy to be here, right, Karen? <laughs> 
<laughs> okay then. So if there are no questions, then we shall go to Mr. LK Wong. Let me do a short introduction about ERA. Uh, basically, ERA was established in 1986 as a resource center to pool the expertise, talent, skills, and experiences of retired or retiring professionals and to coordinate the activities so that they can contribute, contribute beneficially to society, especially the business community in their golden age. So Mr. Wong LK Lianqi is a uh, long form. He's basically, um, he served as a regional ICT head of operations, uh, head of operating offices in Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Hong Kong, Indonesia, and Japan. He's been exposed to IBM mini computers, and he's a lot involved in application software development for more than 25 years. His job usually includes feasibility study, system designing, system development, system testing, system implementation, maintenance, and computer tradings. So Mr. Wang, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can, can. Uh, may I, okay, good, good afternoon. Uh, Yang Mahagia, uh, I'm Sri uh, uh, Azma Hashim, President of Masas. Uh, Mr. Yong Chong Soon, President of My Era. Excellencies, panelists, participants. Let me firstly thank the moderator, Ms. Hanis Lam, for successfully uh, guiding the uh, discussion this afternoon. Uh, and, uh, and the four panelists who have shared very well on the topics on robotics and AI. How AI and robo robots impact your life. I hope uh, you all have found the session to be of values to you. Uh, I do agree with the Bahagia Tansi Azman when he commented that we will have to coexist with the robots going forward. Robot, robotic applications possibilities and its benefits should be seen in a positive light as this encouraging technology empowered by artificial intelligence will open up immersed business opportunity. Uh, you, have, you have heard that our four panelists have shared uh, so much about the robotic uh, application and all this. Uh, the first, the first uh, panelist, Professor T.S. Dr. Sim, uh, he has shared with us the wave of the AI will be restrictive one and its impact on us will depend very much on the understanding of the technology and how to react to it. The second uh, panelist, Mr. Oliver Tian, has also shared with us that AI and robotics must be adopted to augment or enhance the human capabilities and human potentials. The third Panelist, Mr. Mr. Su has kindly shared with us that uh, cobots are the value proposition and levels in the IR 4.0 toolkit for the SMEs to improve the processes, drive productivity, reduce dependence on labor intensity, and provide the foundation for the adoption of newer manufacturing technologies. And the last panelist, Dr. T.S. Chua, has also shared with us that successful AI application always begins with the first step, although it may be challenging. It is important to have the right people and the skill uh, to be successful in the AI application. Now, please allow us to uh, a minute to share with you about what uh, era is. Uh, our moderator, Ms. Hanis, has kind of uh, shared with you the brief description of uh, Expertise Resource Association. Uh, yes, EIA actually is, uh, is an association set up in uh, uh, 1985 by our founding advisor, Yang Mahagia Tan Sri Dr. Song Siu Hong who is a dynamic and far-sighted corporate leader who have many senior roles in the Associated Chinese Chambers of Commerce of Malaysia, the Federation of Malaysian Manufacturers, as well as in the Masas, besides his successful corporate uh, involvement in the fields of engineering and steel and uh, iron and steel industry. ERA membership 
comprises among others entrepreneurs, corporate leaders, professionals in the fields of science, engineering, finance and management, human resource, media and public relations, consultancy, human resource, media and public relations consultants uh, in this. Our membership to date has about 500 and is still growing. We focus on creating avenues and building platform for networking to help our members to channel their expertise, skills, knowledge, experience, gain over the active years to assist those in the uh, come after them in their respective fields to grow and to do better. EIA's strength lies in the membership of resource persons who can be matched with those in the particular needs, be it in the management or business or technology need, technological niche. EIA also organizes seminars, webinars, such as this one today and other special program designed for special interest group. EIA's motto is to share and to learn together as learning is a long is a long term process for everyone irrespective of age and in the process EIA aims to be a facilitator and to create meaningful partnerships for success. EIA is proud to be associated with the co-organizers of today uh, webinar event, namely the South, South Association, MASA, the Autonomous Intelligence and Robotic Association, MAERA, the Japan Economic Association, MAIJEKA, and Slangor Human Resource Development Center, SHRDC. Please do visit our website, eia.org.my, to know more about us, distinguished guests and gentlemen. Let me now conclude by thanking all of you for spending your time this afternoon with us to learn about this topic on robot and artificial intelligence. The discussion will not end here, but together with the ERA and the co-organizers, we will bring you more such events going forward. Lastly, but not least, we wish to thank the co-organizers for successfully organizing this series of webinars, touching on the various IR 4.0 technologies, spending three webinars co culminating with the third one this afternoon. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Wong Leng Ki, uh, for that closing remarks. Um, I think before you go, uh, I'd like to just want to Thank all of all of you, uh, uh, Sri, uh, Mr. Yong, the organizers, and most of all the participants, uh, panelists, and moderator, uh, for staying on. And uh, I hope it has been a very uh, interesting uh, event. Uh, I myself learned a lot, uh, and uh, it has been uh, very interesting. But before we go, I like to just uh, uh, like to now. Uh, uh, count on participants as we like to launch a poll and we'd like to get your feedback. So for that, I, I like to call on Ms. Muniswari of uh, SHRDC to help us with this poll. So just stay on and just respond uh, to the questions uh, as you see on the screen. Just five, uh, very short. Do I just click on the yes or the no? Uh, once you finish with the five, click on the end poll, the one in red at the bottom. Okay. Is that good, Ms. Muniz? So 
far, only two participants have actually um, voted oh, for the okay. poll. Okay. All right, but we, we don't want to be taking too much time because we mentioned five o'clock. But anyway, okay. we, we thank yeah. you for your yeah. contributions. Yeah. So uh, I shall now uh, 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 bring this webinar to a close. want to thank everyone for your time, uh, for your contributions, for the questions, for the answers. Um, and we hope to see you again uh, in the next uh, series. Um, we, we hope to, to you know, do a fresh batch of uh, uh, webinars uh, for next year. So as it's you know, coming to the close of the year, I'd like to extend our greetings uh, for the, the, the season and uh, hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you so much. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank bye. you, thank you, bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. So how was it everyone? Did you enjoy and learn something new today? We hope you find the webinar beneficial and informative. Thank you for sitting through until the end of the webinar session with us. If you like what you have experienced today and want to join in for more sessions, do not forget to like and follow our social media channels. Simply search SCHRDC on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter as all of our programs are regularly updated there. We will include the links to these pages in the description box below. Feel free to connect with us today or visit our website at www.shrdc.org.my. Thank you and we hope to see you again.